Hi, my name is Kana Llewellyn. I'm a nurse practitioner at Vanderbilt University. Today, I'm gonna to be presenting on behalf of the Mid-South Project ECHO. Uh, the topic for this session is COVID-19 associated isolation and depression in long-term care. And this is a partner uh, series to all our other sessions that we have provided to you. So our objectives for this session are to first describe the psychological burden of COVID-19 on the long-term care staff, to identify at least two symptoms of depression in long-term care residents with dementia, to summarize the relationship between isolation and depression, to recite at least two interventions to reduce depression in staff and our long-term care residents. So first we're gonna talk about staff. Um, COVID-19 associated psycho psychosocial burden on staff. This has been quite significant. We have all experienced it and continue to experience it. There, 41% of COVID-19 deaths have occurred in long-term care residents. Um, and I think that it's important for us to think back on this and realize the burden that this has been to our profession in um, caring for our older adult patients. The isolation has negatively, negatively impacted families, residents, and staff. Um, of course, this isolation was to protect everyone, but it had a significant um, impact on everyone as well. Uh, also, there's been inadequate access at times to PPE. Luckily, this has improved significantly. However, that was a significant stressor for us. Um, worsening resident conditions because of the isolation or um, complications of COVID-19, our patients have more depression, our patients have worsening cognition, and then fear of infection. Um, we have gone through this process and um, being fearful of our residents being infected, um, us ourselves being infected, and then taking it home to our family members. COVID-19 associated psychosocial burdens on staff, um, thinking about specifically depression, anxiety, and PTSD. These are all things that we have um, been um, having an increased likelihood of having because of this experience we've had. And the risk factors for this are female gender, a younger age, high risk environment, poor social support, and limited experience. And unfortunately, uh, nurses have higher poor mental health outcomes. Um, uh, we're not gonna unpack that a lot, but if you think about it, I think that a lot of times nurses are the last one to speak up to say they need help. Reducing psychosocial burden in staff. How can we address this? Well, there's kind of four major categories we envision being able to improve upon in this. One is to have social structural support. This is ensuring that we have family, friends, and community um, available and um, taking time to spend with them. Of course, we have to do this in a safe manner, but as um, more of our family members have been vaccinated, have protection from that, um, and our infection rates decrease, we need to just make sure that we're reintegrating and having that social support structure back in place within the work environment. Um, really making sure that the working conditions are appropriate um, and utilizing best practice protocols. The better the work environment is, the less that burden that our staff are going to have. And then communication. Crucial information from supervisors is essential. Um, we really need to have that communication straight from supervisors and administration so that everyone is well informed. And then there really should be no uh, unreliable news sources as we obtain information as well. While this is external to our communities and facilities, um, they do impact us and how we care for our patients and how we communicate with family members. So just being really sure that the uh, information that we obtain um, is from a reliable source. And then mental health support. Um, it's really essential that when we are in need of mental health support that we reach out and access it. There are help hotlines. Um, we have another session that we talk about self-care, so implementing a good self-care um, into your life. Access to men mental health services, ensuring that there's access um, in your community and um, available to staff members and then identifying individuals at risk. So speaking up if you're having a hard time or if you notice that a colleague is having a hard time, talk to them about it in a supportive way. 
Um, and especially in for supervisors and administrators, talk to your staff members if this is occurring. Be there for them. We have uh, another module on staff burnout resilience and retention as well, and this can be really helpful and is uh, absolutely pertinent to the information provided here to help um, with uh, the issues that we're all experiencing. So when we think about this um, as it relates to our residents, um, they are experiencing a lot of this burden as well. We know that depression and isolation are intertwined. Um, the more isolated our pa patients are, the more depressed they are. And it's just a vicious cycle because if you're depressed, you don't wanna socialize, you don't wanna get out and do things. It's the signs of depression in our residents. Um, so they have what we call an atypical presentation. So what does atypical mean? It just means something that we don't expect for our patients to have. Um, so, uh, especially as it relates to depression, it's something that most people when they're depressed, they don't necessarily have, except our older adults, especially living in our communities, um, can have these type of presentations. So they might have weight loss, fatigue, they may have some vague um, stomach or GI complaints, they may have apathy, which is just the lack of interest or desire to do anything, um, they may have pain, and they may have a loss, a loss of interest in socializing. So you could see that um, a lot of these issues could be written off as something else, but really they are signs of depression in our older adult patients. So what can we do? Well, we can screen them for depression. If you're not routinely screening your patients for depression or your residents, this is one uh, tool that can be really easily implemented and a uh, applied to, to our, our patients. And if they screen positive, then we can move along um, making a recommendation to their healthcare provider um, to look further into it. But this, this particular tool is called the PHQ-2. Um, and what you do is you think about the first um, leader question there. Over the past two weeks, how often have you been bothered by any of the following problems? Um, the first one is little interest or pleasure in doing things. Has it been not at all? Has this occurred several days? more than half the days or nearly every day. And then those same responses apply to the second question as well. Have you been feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? And then you add up the score from both of those questions. And if the score um, is three or more, then that's a positive screening and something should be, uh, it should be followed up on with an, an additional tool, which is, um, another one that's available is the PHQ-9. So this is a really important way we can screen for our, our depression in our patients, our residents, but also in yourself as well. If you answered um, um, uh, uh, yes to some of those questions and, and you scored a three or more, then, then you should talk to someone yourself. So how can we reduce depression? <clears throat> well, we can manage it and we can prevent it. Within management, there are antidepressants that are available that can be very beneficial. There's also talk therapy or psychotherapy that's available to residents and um, uh, can be connected whether in the community or within the facility. We can um, have input from family and friends and just have that open communication what's going on um, and see if they can step in and be more available. Uh, reduce isolation. So how can we get them out and about in a safe way, engaging with other residents, um, maybe having some spe specific activities we know they would actually enjoy doing and some activities that really show support uh, for improvement in depression are pet therapy and music therapy. And then when we think about prevention, so we can anticipate depression. Um, if someone's had a recent loss, if they have a big transition, they're moving into the facility, they're a new patient, they've been living at home in the community, or if there's a new um, serious illness. So we can really anticipate what's going to happen and have those support services in place before um, the depression occurs. We can reduce isolation. Um, we can have those activities available for them. And then um, getting folks outdoors. Um, of course, with the extremes of temperature that we may be having, whether really hot or really cold at certain times of the year, outdoors can be challenging, but even if it's just for a few minutes. Uh, and what I like to, to talk to patients about is that um, let's just set some small goals. Make one change this week, attend one activity this week. The next week, attend two activities or sit outside for a goal of 15 minutes. So just starting small um, is easier than just saying, all right, we're going to go to every activity because that's going to be overwhelming for them. 
I do want to make sure that you all are aware of the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Suicide does not differentiate between age, socioeconomic status. Um, so it's just really important that we're aware um, that anyone can be feeling like they want to kill themselves or commit suicide. And we need to be available and to support depending on the level of depression that they're experiencing and screen for it and make sure that this resource is available to everyone. Social isolation. So this is really important component for us to talk about as it relates to um, depression and what our patients are experiencing. The impact of isolation has been significant. I know you all are well versed in this, but that isolation has caused loneliness, hopelessness and despair and depression. Um, it's also um, um, has a caused people to have lack of cognitive stimulation, which has had people progress in their um, uh, uh, severity of their cognition or worsening of cognition. And then it all leads to a worsening of medical problems. And this all stems from isolation. So it has been quite profound. Um, so we really need to have great interventions in place to address isolation, because if we do, we can reduce, reduce these medical issues and improve cognitive um, function. So how do we reduce loneliness and isolation? Um, well, really a conscious effort to promote that socialization and cognitive stimulation for our patients. Utilizing sorting games like bingo or group exercise, having activities that involve family members and loved ones, uh, recreating a sense of community within the facility. Um, there's some really fun activities that I have seen some nursing facilities do, uh, one of which was a nursing home prom. Um, they had wheelchair dances, for example. Uh, having a 4th of July celebration. Um, I, we're recording this session actually right, right before the 4th of July. So um, just any small way that we can find a way to celebrate. Having realistic toys. Um, there's readily available dogs and cats and baby dolls that are um, interactive and, and can I've seen be really helpful for some of our patients with more advanced cognitive decline. Um, this little robot that you see here in this picture is actually one that's being developed here at Vanderbilt to address isolation uh, for our patients. So um, that's maybe what um, we can see more of in the future. Um, another thing that can be helpful are video calls with loved ones. Um, I know that uh, you probably have utilized this, but um, just because we're out of um, the significant um, isolation that we've had with the facilities being closed and no one being allowed in, I think that we should still continue to offer video calls, especially to our patients who have family members out of state. Um, and just regularly communicating that that's an available option. Sometimes family members don't want to burden staff with arranging that, but if you just kind of have a lot of time um, within um, uh, promoting social isolation um, awareness that you guys are gonna be intentional about offering video calls that can be really uh, impactful for our patients and their family members. I wanna thank you for taking the time to watch this session. Again, this is the Mid-South Project Echo and you can feel free to reach out with, to us if you have any questions. Thank you and have a wonderful day.